Thank you, Mark, and good morning. And it is good to see all of you here. Good to see Diane Smulin here. After her infamous, treacherous horse ride, she's recovered, and it's good to see all of you here. And We won't pray for everybody by name, but I know as I look over the congregation, there are issues that all of us face, and... Um, We'll look to the Lord in a moment for that. But this morning, we're going to look to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. One of the great texts of Scripture. We're in a great book of Scripture. Of course, they're all great. I know that. But uh, the book of Ephesians has great theology for us. And, and when you reach kind of the high point here in these texts that we'll look at, which... Um, as to borrow Paul's words from uh, 2 Corinthians 2, is uh, an aroma from death to death to some, but an aroma of life from life to life to others. And that certainly is true for me. These are glorious verses. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, so that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and bless our time together, we pray. <clears throat> Sandra, thank you, that's beautiful. And Elizabeth, thank you. Some of you will remember an advertisement for the investment firm Smith Barney from the late 1970s. It featured the distinguished old actor John Hausman, he was dressed in a severe three-piece suit and bow tie, looking serious, he would say, at Smith Barney, they are busy as bees. They make money the old-fashioned way. They earn it. It was an effective ad. That's what we admire and trust, hard work. It's biblical. It's the Proverbs. The one who gathers increases it. The sluggard gets nothing. Hard work is a virtue. It's what the German sociologist Max Weber called the Protestant work ethic and the Calvinist work ethic. Christians ought to be honest and earnest and diligent in all of their labors. That's how we earn our bread, by the sweat of our face. Maybe the only place that does not apply, and where man always applies it to his great loss, is salvation. Human religion is based on the notion of working hard and earning it. But the Bible is clear. We are all sinners. We're fallen, and we're in need of saving. But we are only saved by grace, through faith. It's all a gift of God. Sometimes in business, hardworking firms don't succeed. Smith Barney is gone. But in religion, men never succeed when they try to earn it. Paul makes that very clear in our text, Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. In fact, we might say, we get salvation the old-fashioned way, we receive it. Salvation by grace alone is not a New Testament innovation. It's in the earliest chapters of the Bible. When God found Adam and Eve naked and guilty in the garden, He had mercy on them. He gave them the promise of a coming Savior. Then He made garments of skin, clothing them. He slew animals to do that. What a picture that is of the very thing He promised them. He called Abraham out of paganism and gave him a promise. When Abraham believed it, 
He was reckoned righteous. It's righteousness by faith. It's all of grace from beginning to end, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of it. And it must be because as Paul wrote at the top of this chapter, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You Ephesians, you people at Believer's Chapel, dead in your trespasses and sin. And dead means dead. Not almost dead or mostly dead, but dead, lifeless. As the physically dead don't see or don't respond to light, the spiritually dead don't respond to truth, to the gospel. Our condition was hopeless. But God, Paul wrote in verses 4 and 5, being rich in mercy, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. Again, that's not some New Testament novelty. It, it's the New Testament equivalent of Ezekiel's Old Testament vision of the valley of dry bones in chapter 37 of his prophecy. It's a vision and prophecy of Israel's future conversion and restoration which shows it will not happen by the works of the law, but by God's mighty power and grace alone. The prophet saw a valley full of bones, and he said they were very dry, undeniably dead bones and dead for a long time. He was told to prophesy to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. When he did... The bones began to rattle, then joined together and were clothed in flesh. Then God breathed on them and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. God called it the whole house of Israel. And that will happen. But they are also a picture of every believer in every age, every believer today. We all were as lifeless as dry, dusty bones until God's Spirit breathed breath of the breath of God and the breath of life into us, and we came to life and we stood up. That's grace. God's power, Paul wrote in chapter 1, verse 19, the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. Now, if that doesn't make you want to praise God, maybe you're still dry as old bones. It made Paul praise the Lord from the, from the depths of his heart. So he magnified God's grace in chapter 2 and, and gloriously here in verses 8 through 10, which gives us a summary of the gospel, a summary of the good news of salvation. We can't earn it. Salvation is of the Lord. That's Jonah chapter 2, the, the last verse is how he concludes his prayer. Salvation is of the Lord. It's all of grace. That's verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. That is the second time in this chapter that Paul said that. Earlier in verse 5, he interrupted his thought to say, by grace you have been saved. So, so obviously... Paul can hardly contain his enthusiasm for grace. And he wants us to have that as well. He repeated it. Princeton professor Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, one of my very favorites, wrote that the whole gospel turns as upon its hinge on this fact that salvation is of pure grace. He wrote that there are three ideas communicated in the word grace. First, the idea of power. It does not instruct, he said, it energizes. It gives life. But grace is not bare power. It's also love. It's power directed by love. That is the fundamental meaning of the word grace. Favor, love, yearning, desire. The third idea, he said, is gratuitousness, gift. 
Grace is free because it is love, free for sinners. So he defined grace as love to the ill-deserving. Grace is unmerited favor. It is power, it is love, it is free. Not of works, Paul said. We do nothing to merit or deserve salvation, to, to win forgiveness of sin, get deliverance from eternal death and slavery to sin. Salvation is a gift of God that we can only receive by faith alone. And faith, very simply, is trust. A fuller definition of faith is given in three words. Dr. Johnson, many of you will remember, would recite them in Latin. Notitia, ascensus, fiducia. The last time I had Latin was when Literally, John Hausman was saying, they earn it. So my Latin has gone the way of Smith Barney. But the English is knowledge, assent, trust. First, it involves knowledge. That's rather obvious, isn't it? A person must understand what is believed. Can't believe what we don't understand. We must, we must have a knowledge of of the propositions, of the doctrines of the Bible, and meaning of the gospel. That's not enough, of course. It's not enough to believe in God. Pagans believe in God. They believe in the gods. Jews and Muslims believe in God. God, but the God of the Bible is not the God that they believe in. The God of the Bible is a trinity. He is the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God and three persons. The triune God, who worked together perfectly in the Godhead to bring about salvation. God sent the Son to be the Savior by becoming a man. The eternal Son of God took upon Himself a human nature and a human body. Jesus, without sin, the perfect offering, who offered Himself up as a sacrifice for sinners, taking our place in judgment so that we would escape that judgment. Bearing our sins, bearing our, ga our, our guilt, and uh, absorbing all the wrath of God against all of that so that we would not experience it. But it's not enough to know the propositions or formal statements of the gospel. A person must also give assent to them. There must be agreement. There must be an acknowledgement that yes, they are true. I understand it. I know it. I believe that it's true. But then having recognized it is true, that Christ is both God and man, the second person of the Trinity who's come to be one of us and joined in this unique union of His human nature and His divine nature, that He alone is Savior, only He could save. A person must also trust in that alone, trust in Him alone, and rest in that truth. A story often cited to illustrate this faith is the story of Charles Blondin, a French acrobat famous for crossing Niagara Falls on a tightrope 160 feet above the water. On one occasion, he took a stove onto the tightrope and cooked an omelet above the falls. On another occasion, he took a wheelbarrow across, a wheelbarrow across the tightrope, blindfolded. And once he carried a man across on his back. In fact, if you look this up, you will see pictures of him with a man on his shoulders going over the falls. And after bringing the passenger over safely, he asked the man in the crowd, do you believe I could do that with you? And the man said, of course. When he said, well, hop on, the man refused. And the point of that is he didn't really have faith. Real faith involves trust 
a movement of the will. Now, I wouldn't have hopped on either, but I'm a man of faith. I also believe in wind. And I know that a gust of wind could have knocked him and me over into the falls. Uh, the acrobat was good, uh, but he's not perfect, not immutable, and not omnipotent. So it, it's really not the best example. The only example is the best example, and that is Christ. He cannot fail because He is God. And knowing that to be true, we trust in Him. Without faith, without knowledge, assent, and trust, there is no salvation. In a moment of, of utter despair, when the man had come to the end of himself and was about to fall on his sword and end his life, the Philippian jailer cried out to Paul and Silas who would said, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Sirs, he asked, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Simple, isn't it? Very uncomplicated. Believe in the Lord Jesus. You will be saved at that moment. Then they explained the gospel to him and all who were in his house, and they were baptized. Not to be saved, but because they were saved. The gospel is simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Spurgeon told the story of an old unbeliever who who was dying when a Scottish preacher named Mr. Ennis came to visit. He asked the man about his faith. He answered, Mr. Ennis, I am re relying solely on the mercy of God. God is merciful and He will never condemn a man forever. Well, that's a little bit like the poet Heinrich Heine on his deathbed where he famously said, God will forgive me, that is His business. Well, when things got worse and the old man was near death, Mr. Ennis went to him again. This time the man said, oh, Mr. Ennis, my hope is, is gone. For I have been thinking, if God is merciful, God is just also. What if instead of being merciful, He should show me justice? I must give up my hope of, mercy, of the mercy in, I must give up my hope in the mercy of God. Tell me how to be saved. And so the minister told him Christ and how He came to save sinners. He did this by going to the cross to die in their place. And Jesus promised that all whom the Father had given to Him would never be lost. The dying man responded, Mr. Ennis, there is something solid in that. I can rest on that. I have found I cannot rest on anything else. And that's what we do in saving faith. We rest on Christ. We believe the Word of God and we rest in the promises that are there. Rest in the truth of the Gospel. Confident that it is true. It's true because it's God's Word. It cannot be false. It's light and we receive it. That's our necessary response to the good news of salvation. But that's not a response that, that we can take credit for. Because Paul quickly adds, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But what is the gift of God? What does the pronoun that, that not of yourselves, refer to? Well, it would seem to refer to faith, since faith is the word closest to the pronoun, and generally a pronoun like this or that or it refers to the nearest word that precedes it. And that fits Paul's purpose here very well. His, his point is to show the free nature of salvation, that there is absolutely nothing about it of which we may boast. And the most effective way to show that, that we are, 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 are um, not only saved through faith apart from works, but that even our faith itself is the gift of God. 
How else could you show more clearly that it is not of us in any way? We cannot even take credit for the faith that we exercise. Now, the problem with that interpretation is uh, grammatical. It's what we might call a gender gap. And what I mean is that the two words, faith and that, differ from one another in gender. In the Greek language, words have gender. They're either masculine, feminine, or neuter. Faith is feminine, but the word that, this pronoun, that not of yourselves, is neuter. And usually pronouns agree in gender with the words that they refer to. Now, it's, that's not always the case, but we would expect here to have that to be the case, that, it, that, that, that the if, uh, that, that it, that the pronoun that is referring to faith, uh, but they don't agree in, in gender. So how do, what do we make of that? Well, Calvin and many others have understood this as that referring not just to faith, but to the whole preceding sentence. By grace you have been saved through faith. The whole event is not of ourselves. Now that would account for the neuter pronoun. It refers to the feminine words grace and faith, but also to the masculine participle have been saved. How do you refer to a to two feminine words and one masculine word when you're referring to both of them, well, you'd use the neuter pronoun for that. And that probably grammatically is the safest explanation. But, but either way, we come out at the same place with faith being a gift, which is clear from the, the, the teaching of Scripture elsewhere. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Now that's a kind of surprising statement in one way. We get to suffer for Him. That's a gift is what he's saying. We don't think of it that way, but he's also making the point. We have believed because it has been granted to us. Granted means given. It's been given to us to believe. When, when Peter told the church in Jerusalem that, that Cornelius and his house, the Roman centurion and those of his family and the friends also, the Gentile friends that had gathered, received the Holy Spirit, the people in Jerusalem, the Jewish people, the Jewish believers, praised God. And they said, God has granted to the Gentiles repentance. Acts 11, verse 18. Repentance is a gift, granted, given. Maybe the best example of this is Acts chapter 16 and the conversion of Lydia. Paul and his companions had come to Philippi, and on the first Sabbath they went to the riverside where a small group met. Luke wrote that as Paul was preaching, Lydia was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The Lord opened her heart. That's the Spirit's work. As a result, she understood His message, and she responded to it. She believed because the Holy Spirit gave her faith. And He gave her faith in this sense. He gave her life. He opened her heart, and with life, with regenerating life, she naturally responded in faith. She had eyes to see, as it were, and ears to hear. Imagine the disciples in John chapter 9 talking to this blind man. You know, they asked the Lord, Who's, why is this man blind from birth? Is it his parents' sin or his? And the Lord disabused them of that. Neither. This is to show the glory of God. But imagine they engaged him in conversation. And they said, I just want you to know what a beautiful world it is out here. I know you can't see it, but I'll describe it to you so you can appreciate it. There's color everywhere. All kinds of color. The grass is green, the sky is blue, and 
he'd respond, what's color? He's never seen any of that. And how do you explain color? You can't explain it. But then he goes down to the pool of Siloam, he washes the mud out of his eyes, and he looks up at the sky and says, that's blue. Uh, that, the color, it, 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 it has a direct, immediate effect upon us. It, uh, J.I. Packer put it this way, it, it forces itself on our senses. We don't reason it, we just know it. That's blue. This is light. Those are red. I couldn't explain the colors of those flowers to someone who can't see, who was born without sight. But this is the way the new birth is. We're born again and suddenly we have eyes to see and we see it. We know it instantly, immediately. The truth of God's Word impresses itself upon us, forces itself upon our mind and we know it's true and we believe it and we rest in that. That's true of everyone who has believed in Jesus Christ. Our faith is not of ourselves. It is the work of the Lord God. All of salvation is a work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the gift of God. John Stott warned against thinking that salvation is a kind of transaction between us and God in which He contributes grace and we contribute faith. For, he wrote, we were dead. Now that disabuses us of that whole idea. It's all of God. And for, for, for the dead to have faith, it must be granted. It must be given of God. The transaction that did occur was between God the Father and God the Son when Christ paid all of our debts on the cross. And the proof that God accepted that payment for us, the receipt, as it were, is the resurrection. Faith does not save. Christ's death saves. Faith, as Lloyd-Jones put it, is merely the channel, the means of receiving what Christ has already accomplished and has obtained for us. And it, again, is a gift and nothing for which we can boast or take any credit for. And to make that certain, make certain that there's no question about that, Paul added verse 9. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Not of works of any kind, whether they are good deeds or whether they're acts of morality or charity or religious ceremonies like baptism or taking the mass or teaching Sunday school. Salvation is free. And Paul made a point of that so that we would not boast. But that is one reason the gospel is such an offense an aroma of death from death to so many. People and religions of the world want to boast. They want to be able to say, I earned it. And so salvation is a free, as a free gift goes completely contrary to man's natural way of thinking about salvation. All of the religions of the world are based on works on human effort of one way or another, one kind or another, something that man supplies to it. Among the pagan religions, we see that. It, it, it is a kind, it, the whole basis of that is a kind of quid pro quo, a favor for a favor. The ancient Mayans believed that you have to take care of the gods if you want them to take care of you. And so they made sacrifices daily Constantly, they were, those sacrifices were being made, and many of them were human sacrifices. It was a religion driven by fear. That's natural religion. Whether it's, it's keeping the, the law of Moses, or it's following the rules of Islam, praying five times a day toward Mecca, following a diet, not eating pork, 
In every case, while the details may differ, the principle is the same. It's all a matter of what a person does to gain and to maintain the approval of God or the gods. It's uncertain, it's exhausting, and it's utterly futile. Salvation is not of works. It is only for those who can understand we receive it. It's a free gift. The Lord gave an illustration of that in one of his parables, that, that of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18. Both men went to the te temple to pray. When the Pharisee prayed, he drew attention to the evils of others which, which he had avoided and to the good works that he practiced. And thank God that, that he was good and not like that tax collector behind him. But the tax collector behind him had no good works to boast about, nothing to recommend him to God. He was a sinner, and he knew it, and it grieved him. All he could do was beat his breast and cast himself on the Lord and pray, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Not a sinner, the sinner. He didn't lessen his load of guilt. He confessed it. Then Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Salvation is all of grace. The free gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Now, does that mean we can ignore good works? That they have no place in the Christian life? Of course not. They're necessary. They are, in fact, inevitable. A person who has life will exhibit life. And Paul makes that very point next in verse 10, where he wrote that we were created for good works. They're not the basis of our salvation. They are the purpose of our salvation. We are created for good works. Holiness is not an option. Back in chapter 1, verse 4, Paul wrote that God chose us from all eternity to be holy and blameless before Him in love. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Paul wrote that Christ died for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify so that uh, we would be, as he says, zealous for good deeds. Zealous for good deeds. They are not an option. There's no such thing as casual Christianity. Christians are saved to be zealous for good deeds. We are to be earnest for honesty and purity, diligence and, and labor and generosity. It, it's, it's what we are as Christians. It's our new nature. Luther and the Reformers put it well. Justification is by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. A living faith is an active faith. And good works are the evidence of God's work of grace in our lives. In fact, good works are the product of God's grace. Paul doesn't let us for a moment get away from sovereign grace. He calls, uh, he, he calls us God's workmanship. We are, we are what He has made us to be. We're not self-made. Ultimately, all of the credit goes to the Lord. He, he is like a, a great artist or a great sculptor who has fashioned us into the image that we, we have, and He's patterned that image after the image of His Son. In fact, the Scriptures compare the Lord to a potter who has formed us out of a lump of clay. And here Paul says, we are His workmanship. 
In the original text, the word his is the first word in the sentence to, to lay stress on it, emphasizing the fact that God alone has done the work and is presently doing the work. He, he is not done forming us. We're being sanctified, transformed at every moment of our life. But what a work it is. When we were dead, He made us alive. He has transformed us from, from uh, people who were indulging in the desires of the flesh, as He said in verse 3, to people zealous for good deeds. That is again the greatness of His power toward us who believe. Stated in chapter 1, verse 19. It's God's grace. Sovereign grace. Now Paul wrote two final truths that should encourage us as well as stimulate a, a positive response, one of obedience. He, he wrote that we are God's work, born again, were created in Christ Jesus for good works, and that God prepared those good works for us beforehand so that we would walk in them. So because we have been put in Christ, we have His life in us. Just as a branch in a vine has the life of that vine in it, it makes the branch fruitful. And Christ's life in us enables us to act and to do good. We think differently from the way we did when we were following the course of this world at a, at a different direction, uh, 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 following the prince of this world, as he put it. Now we want to live for the Lord, not for the other things. We want to, to, to please Him and glorify Him. And, and His life in us enables us to do that. But in addition, Paul adds that the good works we were created for were prepared beforehand by God so that we would walk in them. Now that's, that's a surprising statement, I know, but this word prepared beforehand is used in Romans chapter 9, verse 23, of God preparing us beforehand for glory. And it's used in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, of, of glory being prepared for us. Heaven is things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. He has gone before us to prepare a place for us in heaven. God prepares things ahead of time. God the Father who chose us for faith and eternal life from all eternity has put us in Christ so that we have powerful life in us, and He has even prepared for us good works that we're to walk in. We can't even take credit for the good things we do. Salvation from beginning to end is of the Lord, which is humbling. It's not a pretext for laziness or thinking, well, it doesn't matter how I live. God's prepared good things for me to do. I'll do what He has prepared and no, that's, that's not the thinking of a born-again mind and heart. That is evil reasoning. It's just the opposite. God has graciously given us good works and abundance of them. We're rich in good works, so must, we must get on with it and live in them. Do them. He has given us the power to do that. That's godliness. It's the, the purpose of God's great gift. It is all of grace, and, and that should lead to thanksgiving, praise, and action in the abundant life that God has called us to, the abundant life that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 10, verse 10. We have that, and we're to live it. Are we doing that? Are we walking in the good works that have been given to us? 
or walking in what Psalm 1 calls the counsel of the wicked. A moment ago, I said there's no such thing as casual Christianity. But Christians do fall into that and they drift. They become worldly. We are all prone to wander and the influence of the world and the flesh and the devil are strong. Stronger than we are in and of ourselves. We need to encourage one another in our walk of faith. Scripture teaches that. Bear one another's burdens, Paul told the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. But I think nothing will keep us steadfast like an understanding of God's sovereign grace his powerful love, His unconditional love, as we understand all that He has done for us, as we understand that, to the degree that we understand that, we will want to live for Him. It is the greatness of His power toward us who believe. Have you believed? Or are you still in unbelief walking according to the course of this world. That's a walk to destruction. If I could become uh, all the, the more biblical in stating it, that is a walk toward the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. Only God can change that course. Look to Him, ask Him for mercy. He will give it. He will open your heart like He did Lydia long ago to believe the Gospel and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help you to do that. May God help all of us who have to rejoice in this amazing grace that's ours. Well, let's stand and sing a hymn of praise. Number 40 in the Songs of Praise, Arise My Soul. Father, what a blessing to know that we and be called ransomed sinners. Bought by the precious blood of Christ. And because we were bought by Him, by Your grace, we can speak of You no longer as our judge, but as our Father. And use that most intimate of terms, Abba, Father. We give You thanks and praise for that. Bless us, Lord, now as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.